When the moon is full in North Alabama, when clouds pursue their own agenda, gobbling up sky as if they owned it, dark nights get darker and strange things are known to happen. Balls of light appear and disappear. Floating orbs flit among the trees and serene pastures become killing fields. Farmer David McClendon knows, to him, the lights in the sky aren't a casual diversion. McClendon's means are modest, his profit margin slim. So when one of his calves is silently butchered in the night, just yards away from his bedroom, he's more than curious about the culprit. I called the DeKalb County Sheriff's Department. They come out here, it's here. They looked the calf approximately three to five minutes and told me that uh, it was a predator kill, even though there wasn't no footprints or no sign of blood on the ground. I questioned him right again. He told me to bury the calf and forget about it. A predator, a predator capable of leaving no tracks or signs, a predator which cuts the victimized animal with surgical precision, excising internal organs, even bones, without spilling any blood, a predator which can bring down a healthy calf or even an 800-pound bull, but leave no indications of a struggle. I don't think they want to uh, confront either whoever or whatever's doing this. I think they're scared or they ain't got no answers for you. Who or what sliced up David McClendon's calf, as well as dozens of animals owned by his neighbors? Who or what is responsible for the eerie but beautiful impressions left in crop fields the world over? Why are thousands of people now regurgitating incredible, disturbingly identical memories of encounters with something alien? The UFO mystery used to be much simpler. Lights in the sky. Now you see them, now you don't. But in the past few years, the questions have deepened. Something profound appears to be happening to our planet. Something related to an alien presence. Today, the search for UFO evidence takes us into increasingly bizarre realms. Sand Mountain, Alabama is an ancient and mysterious place. This was sacred ground to the Cherokee Nation. It was here that Chief Sequoia wrote the Cherokee alphabet, inspired, they say, by spirits and visions. The Cherokee are gone, but the spirits remain. Tiny Fife, Alabama, population 1600, as down home as a town can get, a dry county community of farmers with one stoplight, one department store, but more UFO sightings than any 10 big cities. In 1989, Fife was the hub of an international UFO furor with more per capita saucer sightings than any other place in the world. Among those who witnessed UFOs was Police Chief Junior Garmany and most of his officers, along with nearly everyone else in town. I would say at least 75%, and it could go as high as 90%, of the people in this area have seen something that they can't explain. Newspaper man Baker may have ink in his veins, but it's not the type of ink used to publish nonsense or ghost stories. That's not the sort of journalism the people of Fife expect. Baker prints what people here know to be true. Something strange has been flying over Fife for a long, long time. Baker's wife captured photos of one of the odd lights dancing above the horizon. Over the years, Alabama cameras have produced many other photos and videos. As far back as uh, memory seems to go around here, uh, our grandfathers, my wife's grandfather, had a sighting of what he described as a cigar shape back when he was a young man. Yeah, all kinds of different shapes, from cigar shapes to classic flying saucer shape to uh, the lights in the sky. The 1989 UFO flap drew hordes of skeptical, scoffing reporters who ridiculed residents as hicks and bumpkins, leaving emotional scars which are still evident. <laughs> we don't talk to nobody about it. 
Now the reporters are back in force, drawn not only by the latest wave of UFO sightings, but also by what appears to be a related, if gruesome, UFO side effect. That's a good waste of beef, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Police officer Ted Oliphant has made this same macabre walk more than 30 times in six months in cow pastures all over DeKalb County. Someone or something has been slicing up cattle, leaving behind bloated hunks of rotting beefsteak. One of the things you're looking at is like the large oval cut, and then back over this way on the side there, that flat line cut there, there's just mm -hmm. no way that that was done by a predator or any That's animal. Right. animal. They, when it do something the animal does, they tear everything, and that wasn't told where that's cut straight. Mm -hmm. The victimized farmer, who was also a part-time school teacher, doesn't want his name used, but freely states that he doesn't buy the story told by the first lawman to arrive on the scene. Predators didn't do this to his animal. The trachea had been cut needing to, needing to and animals don't cut things, they tear things. They just slab of meat off the back had been cut, and uh, neatly. Uh, no tracks. Uh, it hadn't rained in a couple of days, but uh, if anybody got in here with a vehicle, they'd have to come through my yard. And uh, I've got dogs that bark, and they would have barked quite a bit, and uh, no vehicle come through my yard. A few miles away and a few days earlier, Jimmy and Margaret Pope had looked out their dining room window and made their own grisly discovery. One of their cows had been chopped up in bizarre fashion within spitting distance of their back door. Her sack was cut off, and it was just like it was just sliced off clean, and there was no blood anywhere. And uh, then there was like a four-inch round circle off of her shoulder, and then uh, there was a cut starting in the center of her mouth, and it went all the way around into an oval shape, and her teeth were gone, and uh, there was no blood anywhere. The ground was just uh, it was way undisturbed. It wet too at yeah. that time it went a lot, a lot of rain and it, there should have been some you know should have been some sign of a struggle or something mm -hmm. there was no sign of struggle or anything the ground i mean it was just there was nothing on the ground no blood no tracks nothing his cow had had its rectum cut out sex organs removed and had a strange protrusion here there's an incision along the belly Ted Oliphant's photo album is a far cry from typical. No pictures of the family, no vacation snapshots, just row after row of mutilated animals, a monstrous morgue of tortured bovines, and Oliphant knows them all. Stranger than that was the incision we found on the face of the animal on its right jaw, a large oval incision, jaw stripped clean to the bone, and the tongue was removed, cut out deep in the throat. We always find pretty much the same thing with the animals. Uh, if it's a female cow, the sex organs and the colon have been cored out, almost like you take a stove pipe and had shoved it in there and, and cored out the material there. Um, many times, milk sacs, the udders, are completely missing. Um, jaws have been stripped to the bone. Um, tongues have been removed. Individual ears have been removed. Um, various organs have been removed of the heart, um, male sex organs. We've ruled out predator animals doing this at this point because the majority of the wounds we found on the animals aren't really wounds, they're incisions. Uh, they've been done either with a knife or something much different. Oliphant's insistence that predators could not be responsible for the cattle killings has made him unpopular with rival investigators, most of whom seem to just want this mess to go away. It's really making people angry because they can't find out what's going on. The uh, Sheriff's Department uh, has made a statement that mutilations are not going on, that they're not happening here, but the sheriff's carrying pictures around of cows that have been mutilated, but uh, the PR people are telling us that nothing's going on. When the sun dips below the giant saguaros of southern Arizona's harsh desert, silent death awakens and goes in search of prey. No one can say how many animals have been slaughtered because most ranchers, especially those Native American ranchers who live on the reservations, are reluctant to talk about it. Yeah, there's been a number of rabbits, deer, uh, one horse that I know of, mostly cattle. There's been a case or two, George, where there have been some domestic pets have been found mutilated in the same way. 
And some of the answers they've come up with, here's, the, oh, it's obviously predators. Well, the predators won't even touch the animal after it's been mutilated. Bob Dean, a former military intelligence staffer who spent 14 years with the Pima County Sheriff's Office, has been waging a lonely campaign against what he views as sheer stupidity. Unlike their Alabama counterparts, Arizona investigators have all but ruled out predators as being responsible for the animal mutilations, including the deaths of 50 cattle in one six-month period. Here, the designated mutilator is none other than Satan himself, or rather his disciples, scalpel-wielding Beelzebubs in search of animal parts for use in unspeakable ceremonies. At least, that's the story the newspapers have picked up on. Dean has accompanied investigators to several mutilation sites and says the officers have confided that devil worshippers could not be responsible for this strange harvest. He says, you can forget that. He says, we've been involved with this thing for a long time. He says, we know the Satanists. We actually know who they are. We know their MO. We followed them. I could go and point three or four of them out to you right now. And he says, they're not involved in this. He says, when they go on a scene or they do something, it's as clear as it can be. He says, I'm asking you to consider here that this is an 800-pound animal. There's no sign of a struggle. There's no tracks. There's no markings of any kind. There's no blood in the animal. There's no blood on the ground. How can someone get this 800-pound animal just to lay down? We contacted Arizona agriculture officials who told us that they had consulted cult experts and had found no evidence that devil worshippers might be responsible for the mutilations. In fact, toxicology and other tests conducted on the carcasses failed to even determine a cause of death in any of the animals. What they did confirm is that Arizona ranchers are angry, angry enough to take the law into their own hands if necessary. The animal mutilation mystery started back in 1967, and that first animal was a horse that was found stripped of flesh from the neck up in southern Colorado. And even then, the newspaper headlines in the United States and worldwide were, did a UFO zap this horse? Journalist Linda Howe has been studying the mutilation mystery for more than a decade. In case after case, state after state, Witnesses, including lawmen, report a correlation between animal mutilations and UFO activity. As I uh, researched more and more in the story, I heard from ranchers, from law enforcement, from sheriffs, from even fellow journalists, one amazing UFO story after another. And most people said, I'll tell you off the record, but they did not want to commit themselves to being on television talking about seeing a football field orange glowing light over a pasture where one of these animals was found mutilated. In Arizona, as in Alabama, the mutilations have been accompanied by increased UFO activity. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for showing up. This is UFO AZ Talks. Ted Lohman hosts a weekly UFO TV talk show in Tucson and has become an unofficial clearinghouse for UFO sighting reports. He too notices a correlation between lights in the sky and death on the ground. I think there's a lot of it. it. There's always been a lot of it. Tucson has already uh, always known about it. In Fife, Ted Oliphant struggles to convince his colleagues that predators can't do what's being done. In Tucson, Bob Dean finds himself in the strange position of defending the reputation of satanic cults. Both have suspicions, but neither have solid answers. We'll return to their stories later in the program. I don't think they're here to swoop down on our supermarkets and take us over. And I also don't think they're here to tell us how to clean up the environment and take care of the garbage. Uh, and those are the two kinds of uh, rather simple-minded versions that we're getting all the time. It's far more complicated than that. New York City artist, author, and lecturer Bud Hopkins knows he's bitten off a big chunk. As usual, he finds himself in the unenviable position of trying to convince an audience that space aliens are not only real, they're here. And on a fairly regular and widespread basis, they enter people's homes, float them out through a window or wall into a waiting spaceship, conduct invasive medical procedures, and then return the victims to their beds with little or no memories of these unthinkable encounters. It's a tall order. When people talk about wanting physical evidence in abduction. They really mean one thing. I want to see a spacecraft or a big hunk of a spacecraft. 
I want to walk up to it and see it, or at least I want to see an alien sitting there or a dead alien or something. That's what they want, uh, which is almost like saying uh, about some other issue, f for instance, uh, did Adolf Hitler commit suicide in Berlin? I want to. I want to have been there to see him shoot himself, uh, and I want to see uh, that little burnt mustache and a, and a body and so forth. Hopkins is by far the most experienced and best-known abduction researcher in the world. Abduction guru, his critics call him, a guy out to sell books. A courageous pioneer, his supporters retort, who is dragging the scientific community kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Hopkins has sold books, no question, lots of them. And his lack of scientific credentials certainly opens him up to bitter criticism from those with degrees on the wall. But if he's a money-grubbing messiah, he is among the most reluctant on record. Nobody wants this to be real. Everybody requires it to be on some kind of shelf of the mind that this really can't be going on. Uh, even I feel that need. And I think human resistance to this is so powerful that uh, it cannot be underestimated. Nobody wants this to be true. Resistance to the possibility of alien abductions has been nearly universal among scientists and mental health professionals, most of whom haven't studied the data whatsoever. But it's been a godsend to thousands, perhaps millions, of confused people concerned about their sanity. In a town outside Nashville, Tennessee, a family man named Herman is relating some of the unbelievable experiences he's had since childhood, experiences which didn't make sense until he read about the abduction syndrome. Earliest memories, it, it seemed like that when I was a kid in kindergarten, that all the other kids made fun of me because that when they were sitting there drawing pictures of cars, I was drawing pictures of spaceships and saying that I was talking to the kids and my friends and telling them that by the time that, that I died of old age that they would be, be uh, people from other planets living here on the earth. They all laughed at me and everything, called me crazy, and so I just eventually after a few years of school of ridicule, I just, just withdraw it into myself and didn't, didn't talk to anybody else about it. From about the time that I was 13 that a lot of things started happening about then. The last thing I really remember is running into a light, a bright light shining on the ground. And the next thing I remember is I'm standing in front of my dad's house, which was still about another mile to, uh, away. I'd missed about an hour to an hour and a half of time. And the next morning when I got up, I noticed uh, little scars on each arm, and they looked like a, a little pizza cutter had been rolled down my arm and pulled out little plugs of skin. And then I walked, got to here, and there was this little man standing right there right there by where you are, pretty much right there. But he was really short, and he had on like a silver suit. I think it was like a dark silver suit, maybe grayish suit. And he had a really large head. He was only like to here. Nancy Anderson of Las Vegas has conscious memories of several encounters with alien beings. She also has other telltale signs of abduction experiences, including periods of missing time, unexplained marks and scars, and memories of physical contact with terrifying entities. When I woke up and that gray was across my knees, I was so scared. I've never been that scared in my entire life. And I tried to move or scream, and I couldn't. I just couldn't. I really tried to fight him, and I couldn't do anything. Nothing would come out. I was just, like, paralyzed. He wasn't very heavy on me. He was probably weighed about 45 or 50 pounds. He wasn't very heavy. Elka Emmons can't remember what happened to her. All she knows is that she watched a UFO land behind her home in Michigan. The rest is a blank. It just gradually settled down in the field. And at that point, I panicked. And I shut off all the lights, and I went upstairs, and I hid in the corner of the bedroom. And uh, as I told you, I sat there for what seemed to be no more than a minute or two. And then I woke up in the morning. I obviously lost the time because I, I don't know how I got in bed in the morning. And I lost the whole night. Missing time is the phrase coined by Bud Hopkins to describe the memory lapses reported by three quarters of alleged abductees. It is but one of the common denominators reported by so many people all over the world. People who don't know each other and who have nothing to gain by relating their stories. The scope of it is enormous. I have uh, had uh, police officers who are abductees have come to me. I've had housewives. I've had uh, two people who are well known in the entertainment field or abductees. I've had 
as I mentioned, psychiatrists who are abductees, psychologists, doctors, nurses, lawyers, uh, a full colonel in an important position. The Army recently came to me about his experiences. This is a, a completely cross-cultural uh, phenomenon. It, it gets into every socioeconomic area. The only things all of these people have in common are their recollections of these unbelievable encounters and their desire to understand. For the most part, they haven't received much help from science or the mental health profession. Such critics as Carl Sagan have dismissed abduction reports as hallucinations, fantasies, hoaxes, or the result of psychiatric traumas brought on by childhood sexual abuse. There's only one problem with these various explanations. None of them fit the facts. The cliche image is, well, a psychiatrist could explain this away. But the psychiatrists themselves are saying, in fact, we can't explain them away. In fact, this is extraordinarily interesting and important. And I think that little by little, more and more people as they've come into first-hand contact with this material uh, are realizing that they're up against, at this point, what may be the most important event in human history. Gaining acceptance and assistance from science and medicine has proven a rugged challenge, but change is in the air. More on that in a few minutes. Oh, well, tell us about the last time when you were abducted, the, the very last time. If talk radio really is the last bastion of direct democracy, then what is the public trying to tell us about UFOs? Nationally syndicated hosts like Billy Goodman know that the UFO topic in all of its forms is a staple. It is raised night after night, year after year by audience members. While most other media can't or won't address the subject, talk radio revels uh -huh. in it. And what was your encounter like, may I ask? Several disc-shaped objects flew above my house, hovered, uh, maneuvered in various manners. Hovering discs are somewhat passe these days. Radio shows, TV tabloids, and popular books have repeatedly covered this ground. But it almost seems as if the phenomenon itself wants to up the ante. In the 40s and 50s, UFOs were little more than elusive lights in the sky, a popular curiosity. This, for example, is regarded by some as the first modern-era UFO photo taken in 1947 over Seattle. In the 1960s, the lights started landing. Credible witnesses, such as New Mexico police officer Lonnie Zamora, risked their reputations by reporting what they had seen. Several thousand landing site cases have since been documented. It was also in the 60s that the first cases of alleged alien abductions gained prominence. Betty and Barney Hill's lives were turned upside down by their seemingly incredulous account. They weren't really the first, and they certainly weren't the last. In the 70s, burgeoning abduction reports bubbled to a surface suddenly crowded by equally bizarre phenomena. Animal mutilations, temporarily centered in the American West, and inexplicable crop formations, focused in Britain. Similar formations appeared in the ice of frozen lakes in Russia. UFO sightings were linked to all of the above by witnesses and researchers. The 80s and the 90s have seen the stakes raised once again. Reports of abductions have escalated, mutilations abound on a worldwide scale, and crop formations have progressed from simple circles to intricate designs on every continent, as if someone is trying to tell us something. You've got the people that say that, that they're aliens from space trying to tell us something. But then someone else says, well, if they're trying to talk to us, they aren't doing a very good job. Scientist Dudley was drawn into crop formation research when someone asked him to take a look at some soil samples from an English field. Yes, what we found were short half-lifed elements that could only be produced by high-energy physics. Uh, these elements were not the typical elements you find in hospital waste or even from nuclear reactors. They're the kind of elements you would find if you were to bombard soil with some high-energy uh, protons or deuterons. Dudley, along with scores of other scientists and researchers, ended up in England during crop circle season, although the term circle doesn't do justice to the shapes exhibited by unseen artists. Just when observers would boastfully announce that they had figured out the physics of the formations, the rules would change, almost as if someone was listening. There is every indication that there is very high intelligence behind this. There's, there's lots of other things. For example, all the different dimensions of crop circles end up falling into the diatonic scale of music. The, di the diatonic scale, these ratios do not show up in nature at all. They only show up psychologically in music scales.
Without question, some of the formations were hoaxed. Two English barflies named Doug and Dave emerged for the media and claimed credit for creating all of the English formations, a woefully specious claim considering the sheer number, size, and complexity of some designs, many of which appeared in other countries. Naturally, reporters bought it. A subsequent cash prize contest produced a spirited crop circle competition, which was all the press needed. If some agroglyphs could be faked, then all must be fakes. This was and is the prevailing media attitude, akin to saying that if some $20 bills can be counterfeited, then all 20s must be funny money. Wheat stalks themselves uh, and a real crop circle, one that, that's formed by whatever this energy force is, uh, the, the wheat stalks are bent over at right angles. They're not harmed at all. They continue growing. Uh, and it's as if an energy force field were impinging on the wheat stalks to form these very complicated symbols. It's like a cosmic artist is at work here. Dr. O'Leary and other researchers refused to accept the easy explanation because too much of the emerging evidence suggested otherwise. When the formations were simple circles, a few scientists insisted they were created by wind vortices, mini tornadoes. Others theorized that rooting hedgehogs were the nocturnal artistes. Those explanations were left gasping for air when the phenomenon evolved from interesting circles into huge cryptic agroglyphs. Could wind do this? Could even the Picasso of hedgehogs envision such a masterwork? About half of us at a particular moment saw little red darting lights in, in the wheat fields near where some of the crop circles already existed. And these are, are commonly reported phenomena. Balls of light, uh, absolutely, definitely. Um, I have a, a couple of interviews that I've taken on tape in England uh, where I've interviewed people that saw uh, balls of orange light that appeared over areas where these circles formed that night. From the descriptions that I have heard, uh, they've all been pretty consistent. 75 to 80 foot diameter, uh, dish-shaped, uh, classical flying saucer if you want to call it that. Correlation is not proof positive, but UFOs are seen over ranching communities. Mutilated animals are then found. UFOs are spotted by selective witnesses. Abduction memories emerge. UFOs are recorded above ripened grain fields. Agroglyphs appear. Something is happening. For scientists like Marshall Dudley, the evidence is clear and abundant. Whatever is creating the crop formations has the knowledge and ability to tinker with chemistry, genetics, fundamental physics, a tall order for grain-crunching hoaxsters. If you look at the areas where the, this wilting has taken place, you'll see recrystallization that indicates that there has been some elevated temperatures. The DNA has been blown apart to a large extent. Uh, this is done through uh, a uh, electrophoresis type situation. Um, you can't and do this just by stepping on it. No, you can't do it by stomping it. Uh, and the other thing is that if you tried to sprout the seeds, that you would find that there was a great number of mutations, which ties right into the DNA damage. Crop formations are only one manifestation of the higher stakes. Sightings, landings, abductions, mutilations, messages. Is someone trying to tell us something? And if so, what is it? And this, this uh, shift involves uh, recognition that we're utterly uh, not in control in the universe, that there are intelligences that are far greater than our own, that the whole universe is itself intelligence. This is a change in, in our sense of uh, the universe and ourselves, which is uh, far more radical uh, than any shift that, uh, uh, that I can recall, uh, and, and is terrifying. We have all grown up being told or taught that we are alone. We're alone on the planet. We're alone in the galaxy. And I think that this story that is emerging is showing us that that's not true. We are not alone. That there are alien life forms who are coming here. They are involved with our animal life, our plant life, with us as a human species. <laughs> If the cattle of North Alabama seem a bit standoffish these days, consider what's been happening to some of their kindred cud chewers. Between October 1992 and June 1993, close to 40 cattle in two counties were somehow immobilized, selectively sliced up, 
and left to rot. Since many farmers decide to bury the evidence without filing reports, the true number of cases could be twice as high. And because the mutilations coincided with UFO sightings, clever headline writers dubbed the killings close encounters of the herd kind. Are you a suspect? I better be. Because if I'm not a suspect, they're not doing their job. The irony isn't lost on police officer Ted Oliphant. He became the point man in the cattle mutilation probe almost by default, then found himself among the suspects. Media accounts, spurred in part by tips from rival lawmen, gleefully revealed that Oliphant once produced a video documentary about UFOs before he became a cop. He's never said that UFOs might be responsible for the cow killings, but Oliphant certainly alienated other agencies by insisting that their predator explanation didn't cut it. Right now we have no explanation for who or what is doing these things to these animals. We've got no suspects, we've got no evidence other than the carcasses that are left behind, we've got no eyewitnesses, and we have absolutely no motive for why people would be doing this. Other investigators belittled Oliphant's work and his background, but he had no such problems with the farmers, especially those who'd been victimized. David McClendon felt insulted when sheriff's deputies told him his calf had been killed by a predator. So instead of burying the carcass as he was told, he piled it into his pickup and took it to Oliphant, who quickly pointed out the unnatural incision pattern. Uh, stair step type incision along one of the cut lines. It's just jagged stair step, but all, each step was approximately the same, you know, size and everything, you know, much like stair steps. The same sort of odd cuts have been reported in hundreds of other mutilation incidents. Since the phenomenon first gained national attention in the mid-60s with the slaughter of a horse in Colorado, mutilation cases have been reported in nearly every state and dozens of foreign countries. Cattle are the primary victims, but many other animals have also been targeted. In Britain, an outbreak of horse slayings has shocked the public. In Canada, domestic cats have been dissected. David McClendon's so-called stair-step incisions, also known as cookie cutter or pinking shear cuts, have become all too familiar to investigators around the country. The cuts uh, that were made up the uh, legs and the inside of the legs and up the belly uh, looked like you could have taken a zipper and zipped the cow right back together again. They were one-eighth uh, serrated cuts were made on the cow. Uh, we cut down into the animal and found out that the, the ball joint was gone, completely gone, uh, off just that one shoulder and just a perfectly flat cut inside. In many other cases, the phantom surgeons use straight-line, scalpel-sharp cuts, and in others, the cutters rely on something akin to a laser. The tissue had been cooked subjected to high heat, the blood had been cooked, uh, there were basophilia changes that could only occur in the presence of maybe 300, 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, since 1989, we now have over a dozen animals that have fallen into the category of these mysterious mutilations in which there's evidence that high heat uh, was applied to the excisions that automatically eliminates predator. Even more chilling, in a handful of instances, the killers managed to cut between the cells of the animal's tissue. Some of the cuts from whatever you, use they're using, whether it's a laser or what, literally go between the cells. Now, we have no technology that I know of that can even do that. If we don't have such technology, who does? lead you to believe that he possibly could have been a laser. The unnerving experience of finding a cow in this condition prompted many Alabama farmers to start packing guns. Adding to the tension were frequent appearances of unmarked helicopters before and after mutilation incidents. David McClendon saw one of the mystery choppers hovering over his property after the death of his calf. We had been home probably an hour you know, before it ever happened, you know, so we knew right when it got here. If you grabbed the handgun, I mean, what would you have done? I'd have shot. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't believe anybody's got any business, you know, in a helicopter hovering over my pasture. You know. Most people hear helicopters and uh, it's close to high tension wires. And uh, high tension wires are just right over there about uh, 75 yards from here. 
I'd hate for somebody to be flying around in a helicopter and have to land in the yard right now. Because uh, I, I wouldn't want them to take off without the police being out here. The connection between unknown helicopters and mutilation episodes all across the country has been studied for several years by independent investigators like Texan Tom Adams and even by the U.S. Senate. No one knows where the choppers are from or who is flying them. Ted Oliphant suspects that whoever they are, they're monitoring the mutilations just like he is. Who they are, I really don't know. But in many of the cases, they've been on the ground before and after mutilations have been discovered by people. In some cases, it almost seems like we've been in a race with the helicopters to see who can get to the animal's carcass first. In the spring of 1993, rival investigators tried to put a lid on the situation by urging victimized ranchers to keep quiet. Oliphant responded by calling a news conference, the first in the history of Fife. Facing a phalanx of journalists, he introduced, one by one, victimized farmers who weren't buying the predator story. It's a, it's a pretty bad slap in a, a taxpayer's face when you report anything like this to a law enforcement official. And they come out and, and uh, walk around the animal and say, well, predators done this, which I know better than that. Oliphant also released two independent lab reports. One showed evidence that a high heat instrument was used to cut up one cow. Another analyzed an odd white chemical found on a carcass, an unnatural compound which could serve as a cauterizing agent. State and county investigators listened to the news conference, but declined to defend their predator hypothesis. You know, actually, I can't, can't make a comment. In Alabama, as elsewhere, no one has been able to crack this riddle. Suspects include the military, big industry, the TVA, as well as cults and predators. The evidence suggests that whoever is behind it in Alabama and around the world is very cagey. We're talking about tens, literally tens of thousands of cases, nationally and worldwide. No one's ever been arrested. Nobody's ever been prosecuted. No charges have ever been brought against anybody for this. No one's ever been caught. Journalist Linda Howe insists that we must follow the evidence no matter where it leads. The correlation between mutilations and UFOs is indisputable. Everywhere there's one, there's the other. More importantly, there are only a handful of instances in which witnesses say they've seen mutilations in progress. Their descriptions seemingly defy all logic. You have to look to what human testimony comes over 25 years. Eyewitnesses who say that they've seen these small gray creatures with these big black eyes either carrying an animal that's found mutilated or taking an animal into some kind of craft. It is an alien harvest. I think you've got to come to a conclusion that we're dealing with an extremely high technology that may be so far beyond anything we can do here that the only answer I can come up with is there's some alien involvement. And some of the eyewitnesses have supported that view that they have seen mysterious ships, they have seen mysterious non-human entities. One final disturbing note about the mutilations, namely the genetic similarity between cattle and humans. People and cattle share nearly identical chromosomes. In addition, cow's blood is so like ours that it's used to produce human plasma. This raises the eerie possibility that whoever is chopping up cows is studying them in order to learn about us. One is a being called Zosh, and he's just like from everywhere. But the Hupaz is one from Zeta Reticuli. I like working with him. Because Robert Shapiro is a practitioner of the New Age discipline known as channeling, in which alien or spirit entities speak to the rest of us through mediums. speaking. Well, I will respond to questions. Most people, especially scientists, don't give much credence to channeling. Anyone who talks with aliens on a regular basis must have a problem. 
It was the same back in the 1950s with the first of the so-called contactees, people like George Adamski, who claimed to have taken rides on spaceships with Venusians. To the scientific community, it's all one big mixed bag of specious claims, and that bag includes modern abduction reports, which remain controversial even in UFO circles. And there are people who will swear on a stack of Bibles that it's true. Well, I don't know if it's true or not, but the evidence in support of it is, is terribly, terribly weak. My problem with the whole way abductions are studied is that the hypnosis, very often hypnosis is used by people who are not trained to, to do that. Somewhere between 25% and 35% or whatever of all the abduction cases are remembered without hypnosis. And every abduction case, virtually, people remember pieces of it without hypnosis. Hopkins, perhaps more than any other person, has risked all, including his personal life and his health, in order to convince the world to sit up and take notice of abduction reports. Finally, his efforts appear to be paying off. The thing that makes the UFO abduction phenomenon so powerful in that shift is that it kind of gets us where we live. It enters the physical world. It appears to be in the physical world. But once having found us in the physical world, it then drags us out of the physical world. So it is, uh, it's like tailor-made to shatter the arrogance of the Western worldview. Harvard psychiatrist John Mack has taken considerable heat from his colleagues because of his interest in abduction cases, but he's not deterred. Mack recognizes that many scientists simply refuse to believe abductions are real, no matter what. There's a huge amount of physical evidence of what's going on in the abduction UFO world, but there has to be some openness of the uh, of the receiver to that evidence. It requires, like as one Harvard scientist said, that well, one of the we, I have to have a cigarette lighter that was dropped from a UFO. Well, probably they gave up smoking uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, anyway. But but that kind of physical requirement, uh, it's exactly that mentality that this is shifting us beyond. Dr. Mack's entrance into the abduction debate makes it much tougher for science to dismiss the subject without looking at the data first. Those scientists who do investigate are often amazed at the scope and similarity of abductee tales. There were beings around me. They were little short beings, but fairly chubby and heavy on the beings. And there was about four or five of them. And they were busy doing different things as I was laying on the table. Mary has had similar experiences most of her life, so of other members of her family. Therein lies the central pattern of the abduction scenario. It begins during childhood, continues for decades, and seems to follow entire families. What I remember is just um, like the bruises and stuff, and, and always remember waking up thinking that I'd been somewhere, but not knowing where I had been. But um, I remember seeing flying saucers. Anderson has had a lifetime of UFO sightings, abduction experiences, missing time, and unexplained scars. The same was true of her mother, and is now true for her daughter. The basic patterns are so narrowly similar, over and over and over again, that they simply preclude human fantasy as having been the cause. There is a very strong physical component to this data that a person uh, uh, who is abducted actually is missing from their normal environment during the abduction experience. And that uh, people are, have multiple abductions. There are, are people abducted together at the same time who confirm each other's abductions. And some of those people may not be abducted themselves even. And we have independent people who see other people being abducted. And uh, there's scars, right, scars on people's bodies and all sorts of other things. And any theory to a to that explains the abduction phenomenon must take into account the physical aspect of it. And that is why we don't have a competing theory uh, to the theory, in fact, that this is what's happening to people. Dr. Jacques Vallée questions some abduction reports because they were recalled with hypnosis, but he's personally seen the physical effects of alien encounters. There is impact on the, on the skin. They do dis describe a, a hot sensation, but the beam would also pin them down and push them. And we don't know how to make a beam that does that. Psychiatric social worker John Carpenter is another professional who's dared to look seriously at abductions. You don't want to live with that. It is not a fun experience. One of his cases involves a Nevada ranching family whose members have had unusual encounters for years. When we come up to my shoulder, 
and slender and dark eyed. What color hair? Oh, yeah. Mean eyes. Cold. Looks like a dentist's office. And what makes it look like a dentist's office? Everything comes out of the walls and hoses. I don't like it here. Are you aware of how old you are? I'm 14. 14. Susan had a reason for being so certain of her age at the time. Because they went between my legs. Nobody's ever done that. Nobody had done that before. No. no. Since you couldn't move, how did they manage that? I spread my legs. There is no doubt in my mind there is a definite phenomenon occurring. Some kind of uh, intervention, intrusion of some kind of different type of being, whether it's uh, dimensional or extraterrestrial, whatever it is, there's nothing that binds these people together except the common uh, amazing reports that they come up with. Carpenter, well, Max, Jacobs, here. and Hopkins have been taking their case to their colleagues, holding seminars around the country for mental health professionals, hoping to foster better understanding of abductee reports. The response has been modest but encouraging. Unfortunately, there are no answers to any of the big questions. Why is this happening? What do they want? Where will it all lead? It certainly is a good question that why do they need us if they're so advanced? Um, uh, but then why do we need wildlife to do our research? Uh, <laughs> why do we have 2,000 lab rats? <laughs> Uh, why don't we just create our own animals? Uh, it, there, there has to be something to do with our spirit, our soul, our, our uh, brains, something beyond maybe what they can manufacture in the lab. It seems like they're interested also in a relationship with us, in some kind of joining with us. We know infinitely more about this, infinitely more about it than we did 10 years ago. But we still have major air gaps in our understanding because we cannot put ourselves in the minds of an alien intelligence with alien needs, non-human needs, and understand why they're doing and why they're choosing and why they're following people the way they seem to be doing. Who among us hasn't heard this cliché? The universe is so vast, it would be egotistical of us to believe we're the only ones. Like so many time-worn beliefs, this one misses the point. The issue isn't whether life exists elsewhere, but rather, is that life visiting us? And if so, for what purpose? The assumption that UFOs merely represent extraterrestrial civilizations, people like us who just happen to live on other planets, may also be overly simplistic, the true picture of life in our universe may be far more complicated and more wondrous. They are describing phenomena that, and objects that appear very often out of nowhere, disappear on the spot, objects that are changing shapes, objects that merge together. If, if the technology or the phenomenon can do that, it, what that tells me is that it is manipulating time and space dimensions in ways that are beyond our science. And if they can do that, they can be from anywhere, anytime. They don't have to be from a particular planet in outer space. Harvard's John Mack agrees that the aliens may not be aliens at all. They may live among us in some sort of parallel world which we do not yet understand. All of those sources of information that tell us that the uh, universe is not the materially regular, well-ordered uh, machine that uh, we like to think it is, and that uh, there are realms of reality that are far beyond what we can uh, touch and measure with our restricted empirical tools. For most scientists still rooted in the mindset of the 17th century, such concepts are preposterous. If something can't be physically measured, then it can't exist, meaning there are no souls, no human spirit, no God, no alien worlds. 747s are flying over the outback of Australia every day, and the Aborigines look up, and none of them have a piece of one, you know. Uh, but uh, they know that what they're seeing. These things are there, and uh, the evidence is, 
is enormous. Proof is whatever it takes to convince us that something is true. On the subject of UFOs, there is more than enough evidence to prove that something really is going on. But none of it means anything to a person who simply refuses to take a fair look. UFOs have been around a long time. Millions of people over thousands of years have seen them. For centuries, they've been captured in carvings and drawings. Today, they are seen in photos, videos, films, and radar images. UFOs can and do affect our cars, planes, and other machinery. Thousands of landing site traces have been recorded. Soil has been baked, burned, irradiated. Mystical crop formations appear overnight all over the world with changes in the crop's genetic structure. Humans who encounter alien beings report being taken from their homes, probed, their memories altered, and they often carry away marks, scars, and other physical signs. Animals are being harvested by some unseen force and for some unknown purpose. Governments the world over possess secret files which declare flat out that UFOs are real and are here. If someone is simply unwilling to consider the possibility of other life forms, then none of this means much. But for the open-minded, there is evidence to pursue. I think that this is a solvable problem at this point. We are poised now to answer these fundamental questions. After half a century of dealing with this subject, we are now in a position to actually solve this mystery. If this is some kind of an alien life form, that is coming here and is doing this, why? Isn't it incumbent upon every one of us to try to understand more, to try to understand why, and perhaps to even ask for some kind of explanation from our own government about their silence? Those who choose to study the genesis of this phenomenon often pay a high price. Bud Hopkins' work cost him a marriage and his health. John Mack has faced scorn and ridicule from his colleagues. Brian O'Leary was ostracized by his former friends in the astronaut world. Linda Howe and others have been spied upon by government agents. Ted Oliphant had to quit his job as a police officer and left Alabama. The price can be high, but so can the rewards as we grudgingly strive to understand a cosmos that is far more mysterious than we ever imagined. We're dealing with extraterrestrial beings, uh, we're dealing with interdimensional beings, we're dealing with phenomena that go in and out of our physical reality and are right on the fringes of our physical reality. Uh, we're dealing with a technology in which, uh, let's say, mind uh, is supreme over matter. The animal mutilations are real. They happen. They're reported. Human abductions are happening. They're reported. We're sitting at a time, at a crossroads, as we're going into this next century, where I believe firmly that the next big story is going to be contact from something else out there.